Hey there friends, what are the risks of using ChatGPT or other large language models to you as a scientist? I've made a video about this already. I mean, these large language models are truly impressive tools. And I really believe that we will look back at this time and think about it in terms of when things have really changed in academia and beyond. There's no doubt about that in my mind. So I think we are right now in the middle of this transformation where there's going to be more and better language models available and they're going to become integrated in a bunch of apps. You can already see that right now. So for sure, this is an exciting time. And as I explained in my last video, I think you should really embrace this. But given this, what are some of the risks? And I think this is also important to be aware of. And I mean risks for individual researchers like people like you and I. And here are some of the points that I think are important to consider. Falling behind is probably the biggest risk. I think it is not a good idea to just ignore these developments and think, yeah, maybe this will all go away because I really don't think this will go away. So I think if you start playing with this and if you become better with actually productively using these large language models, because I'm a firm believer that you can, then you will have an advantage. And otherwise, if you don't, if you don't know about how prompting works and all this kind of stuff, I think you will just fall behind and you don't want to do that. So of course, in the rest of this video, I'm going to talk about the risks that there are. And I think there are some. The biggest risk may still be just to ignore this new technology. Well, the first point is writing, of course. This is where most people will immediately use it for. And there is, of course, real advantages that you can use this app to, you know, line edit your writing, to give you suggestions when you're stuck in a paragraph and all that, and this is all good. However, I think where there is a risk is if you are becoming over-reliant on the input of this app, of these language models, because writing is also thinking and you should not farm out thinking to these large language models because they don't have understanding. They are impressive tools, but they don't understand what's going on. And so this is your job as a scientist to provide the understanding. So use the app to support your writing, not to replace your writing. Your first draft should be based on your thinking. You could have additional wordsmithing done using this app. Also, you know, critically check what's going on there, but your thinking is the most important thing. The next point is fact checking. One of the most seductive <laughs> aspects of these large language models is that the output is so nice sounding and so smooth that you may confuse it with authority and knowledge in a particular subject. But I'm sure as any of you have played, or played around with these large language models, at least the ones available now, in your own subject area, you will of course have found instances where this thing is completely wrong. And so it is always important to fact check. You cannot farm this out to an app because it is a complicated process of going back to sources and evaluating these sources. And of course, these large language models cannot achieve this. This is, this is up to you as a scientist and this is a super important aspect of what it means to be a researcher. So it's fine to use the output from these apps, but then you need to make sure that you critically fact check it. That you cannot replace or farm out. And I think the danger is in particular when this is actually one of the most interesting thing when you can ask the language models about areas in which you don't have expertise, so you could maybe import some of that expertise. There, of course, your ability to fact check is somewhat limited because it's not your actual area. But then it is important that after you do this initial brainstorming or if you have this additional importing of information from another uh, subject area, that you then afterwards really check if this is all true. The next bit is summarizing. So using these large language models to summarize large bodies of text, for example, into a given number of words. This, of course, is fine. But again, you shouldn't be over-reliant on the ability of these la large language models to provide the most important information. 
without missing some important nuance because that is your job as a researcher. And you know, you cannot expect that large language model to achieve all that. So summarizing may be a really good tool and is seductive because then you have you know, like less to read and of course everybody wants less to read. But that is also really a risk because you may miss some important details, some important conditions in that text, in that summary. And so I'm not a fan of using it for summarizing information just yet, I think, because that is actually really an important skill that you need to develop as a researcher and that you need to have as a researcher. And I don't think you can farm this out to one of these large language models. Basically, these things don't think you need to. And I think that could be one of the biggest risks, I think, in, in the academic context of people that are now basically growing up, if you will, with this technology, that they are just relying on the summarizing function of these apps without actually going back to the source. If this is real, if people really do that, that's gonna spell trouble without any doubt. One of the more exciting uses of this app is to use it for brainstorming, like ask it to make some connections, large bulleted lists of connections between topics. I think this is a fine use of this app. But <laughs> as I've already started observing in myself, maybe <laughs> you become also too dependent on this input and maybe that's gonna really limit your choice in the long term. So it should be one tool that you use to support yourself in, for example, your creative process and in coming up with ideas, but it shouldn't be the only tool. As with everything, if we farm things out to a certain tool or some other method of coming up with something, I mean, there may be a certain degree of a trophy, like we, we um, basically lose the ability to do that ourselves. And I think, you know, looking maybe slightly bit further ahead, then if you become really reliant on these large language models to present you with options to pick from for unusual connections and, and to generate ideas, maybe this is in the end all you can do. So I think, again, I think the dose is the important thing. You should use these large language models to support you in your creative process, but make sure this is not the only input that you receive for this purpose. And maybe the last point is, are you going to be marked as a user of this app, at least in the beginning times of using these apps, in which we are right now, is there gonna be a certain degree of stigmatization, like you are the ones that had to use this app to come up with ideas or to produce this text. On the matter of text production, there's already a clear statement by, for example, Science Magazine, that they uh, will regard the use of this app to produce text that you have produced for this manuscript as basically a case of plagiarism and that is academic misconduct. And uh, while other journals have not made clear statements like that, they've only said like ChatGPT, for example, cannot be listed as an author, is unclear how this is gonna develop further. So I think you don't wanna maneuver yourself into a, into a situation where you have produced text that in the end you cannot use in a, in a scientific journal article, which is after all our goal. So just be wary on how you use it. Use it at the right dose, use it for the right things, use it for the right degree of support. Yeah, this is, I think, the bottom line to summarize this all up. Use this tool to support what you do. Don't have it replace what is your job as a scientist. This, I think, is the bottom line and the common thread through all of the points that I have made. I think it's fine to use it as a, as a tool to support you, um, but then you should draw the line when you <laughs> start realizing that it's really replacing some of the things that you should actually do as a scientist. And what's important and how I want to end this video with is that, you know, we are still figuring this all out, of course. We are um, still figuring out also what is the right level of the use of these apps, how we are calibrating basically right now what would be a, a prudent use of these large language models. But I think it's also important to impress that on people that we train, for example, undergraduate students, PhD students or postdocs, whatever um, your position is as a researcher, 
we should, we should make people sensitive about these points and we should start a discussion on these points in our labs and in our groups, what we consider, for example, prudent use to make sure that it's all used to the best possible extent and not abused as a tool. It's the same with everything. Yeah? With every technology, you can use it for the best possible reasons and to really support you and make everything better. But there is typically also the risk of abuse. And so I think we should make sure where we draw this line, or at least we should have this discussion about where that line might be. And I think that's the most important conclusion from this video. And so let me know what you think, of course. I'd be very interested in your input. I think we're all figuring this out together. There is no prescribed <laughs> pathway towards this. And with that, thanks for watching this and see you in the next video. Bye.